today to explore the mysteries of sound. Sound, vibration, frequency, harmonics of the universe, geometry, energy, law of the octaves, all the foundations of the universe, and the structure of water, mm, how we can use sound for healing ourselves, our planet, our environment, and how sound helps us to remember the source of our being, where we came from. Mm. It's a carrier of information. Sound encodes everything that's ever happened. And somehow it's all in our cells, in our body, in our memories. Yes. Mm. Sound is the key to all cosmo cosmologies of the Earth's creation. According to Hindu myth, all was dark, quiet, and mysterious in the womb of the universe until the first movement created an audible sound in the eternal stillness. And the sound that emerged was Om. And then the frequency of Om, when it got converted into a, a, an image called a, um, um, there was a teacher called Hans Yeni, who was the father of somatics, and he had a tonoscope with quartz powder. And when they chanted Om at the right sound, it had to be the right frequency, when enough monks were chanting Om at the correct sound, the, the quartz vibrated into a pattern and it was called the Sri Yantra. Um, and the Sri Yantra is basically about nine interpenetrating triangles, but Really, those nine triangles that we see, it's the most famous, it's called Sri Chakra or Sri Yantra, but it's the most famous image in, in the world. Mm. But it act, it's actually um, a, a memory of the atomic structure of hydrogen, which is number one in the periodic table. So, so a lot of people, when we see these famous Yantras or patterns, these sound diagrams, they're really three-dimensional pyramids. So every triangle is actually a pyramid. So when the, so on a Vedic altar, they would have not nine trains, but like a mountain called Mount Maru. But they were really paying homage to the original sound of the universe called Om. So Om mm. is often represented as like a mountain. Um, Amazing. And what's so interesting is that Om is the sound that the earth makes on its yearly rotation around the sun. Uh, so our modern science has been able mm. to look at the velocity and the speed versus time that a planet takes to revolve the sun and convert that into hertz. And they did that with our earth. And the tone that it ends up being is on, which is so interesting that, you know, the ancients mm. just tuned into that naturally, the inherent sound of the earth, our home tone, um, and would you know, chant that and vibrate that through their body to actually connect into the earth, mm. connect their body to the earth body. And the symbol, you know, the Sri Yantra was the visual representation of that to connect in. Yeah, so when, um, you, when, you, when you invited me to read the book by Hans Kusto, mm. he was saying that when you strike the 136.1 hertz, which is the OM, and, and as you said, it's the tone of the earth of, for the year. That means when you strike that sound, 136 hertz or mm -hmm. om, 
the sound actually goes for the length of a whole year. It's not just like ding and it fades out. The sound carries on vibrationally wow. for the whole length of the year, which is, we can't even imagine that. And that's one wavelength, like you have long waves and mm. short waves. So that's what I love about somatics is that it's making audible that what we can't hear, the inaudible, it's really mm. fascinating. Mm. And so that there's a whole science to music. So as a mathematician, my whole life, after 40 years of research, all I'm interested in now is music because it, music and sacred geometry intersect, overlap everywhere all the time. Yeah. Especially with this thing called the law of the octaves. Mm. And um, so in mathematics, that's the doubling sequence. So when we go one, two, four, eight, 16, that's just, we call it a doubling sequence or a binary code. But that's the key to all the musical signatures and mm. octaves and yeah. the ratios between numbers that Pythagoras was talking about. Yeah. Mm. And that's what I work with with my healing, that understanding of using octaves because I'm working with uh, planetary frequency. But yeah, known since antiquity mm. as the music of the spheres, uh, which Pythagoras spoke about. Um, quite extensively, um, but a lot of people are like, well, how can you, how is, how can you, we, we can't hear the planets, you know, there's no music, you know, what, where is this music of the spheres? But the frequency is actually at octaves outside of our human hearing, or the physical human hearing capacity. So... And they could calculate the orbital speeds of planets because as planets spin, they're generating frequency. Mm. But these ancient scholars thousands of years ago knew the distances of the planets from the sun. They knew the orbits of the planets around the sun. They even knew how long an orbit takes, for example, mm. um, which we only just know now through modern technology. Yeah. Like, for example, the moon orbits around the sun. The, the moon has its own orbit, but it takes the same length of time as it does for one month. So the reason why we never see, we only see one side of the moon is as it's orbiting, it's in parallel mm. with our orbit around the, the, the sun. So we have all this modern technology, but they knew all this stuff. So I don't know yeah. how they knew that, whether through deep meditation or mm. inquiry. Well, when you look back to the Sumerian tablets, um, mm. you know, the first civilization post the great flood, it's all written in there, right. all the information of the constellations, and they spoke about 12 planets back then. <laughs> the Numa Elish. Mm. Yeah, so these are, that, that's why history is so fascinating, and every culture has a different record of how, where, how creation began. Mm. So it's interesting. But what I'm fascinated about is that when we're talking about in, in, the, in the beginning, as you said before, in the beginning was the, the sound or the word and it was on. Well, there's enough talking about beginnings, but we can think about these law of the octaves in the development of the fetus. So if we're trying to remember who we are, because that's the definition of sacred geometry, where do we come from, who we are, um, we can look at our own embryonic development, our creation story. So, so in the beginning, you, you could say, I'm just going to take you on a little journey here because um, I want to get to a point where I want to describe about the development of the fetal ear. But to begin with, we start off with the female egg and a male sperm penetrates that. So that's called fertilization. And so this zygote is the cosmic ovum. And the law of the octave says that the one becomes the two and each cell halves again mitotically. So suddenly we have two, four. So at four cells, we formed a tetrahedron. Mm. Which is, so that's our primal memory. So if you said that to a child, did you know that you were a pyramid? They go, what? How, how could I be a geometrical figure? And at four cells, every cell just divides again, one, two, four, eight. So at eight cells, we've got four spheres here and four on top. And the centers of those eight spheres is a cube. And then the eight becomes 16, which is the cube within the cube, tesseract. So we start off as this male geometry. Mm. And then suddenly, by the time we keep doubling the law of the octave, so this is the octavization of the embryo, we keep doubling 16, 32, 64, I love numbers, 64, yeah. 128, 256. When we hit 512 cells, mm. that's like an octave. At 512 cells, 
the blast, we become a blasted class, all the geometry becomes a big blob. And so it's like a sphere. But then something happens, this sphere of our creation starts to invaginate down the bottom, so a hole appears down the bottom. It's like there's a North Pole and a South Pole, but in the South, the anus is forming. So that's the first memory of life, is that a dimple appears in the South Pole. So mm -hmm. literally, we were an asshole. <laughs> and then from the, from the South Pole, an opening happens in the North, is the mouth. So at one point, we were a mouth and an anus, and the tube that forms in the middle is the first tube becomes your digestion. Mm. And then at the center of that is the heart. So the first organ to appear yes. is the human heart. And the heart has 40,000 neurons in it, which means the heart is already like a little brain. Mm. So a lot of people think that the brain is the first organ to appear. And stay with me because I'm leading up to the ear. So the heart, so, the, so all this blob collapses, the heart starts to form in the center of this spherical mass is a torus. So our first real geometry is the torus and the heart's in the centre, but then uh, that's about all in six weeks and we're only not even one millimetre in size. Then something starts to happen where after six, we're no longer an embryo, so after about nine weeks we're a fetus and then a little ear starts to form, the inner ear. The, the first sensory organ to appear mm. is the ears and um, so we're already bathed in water, and water, as you know, travels, um, the sound travels through water five times faster than it does in air. Mm. Whereas in the embryo, it still has its eyes closed, so the, the eyes aren't important as an embryo. What's important is the ears, the fetal ear. So the, these fetus can now hear its mother, can hear its mother's heartbeat. So there's consciousness and awareness. So this little child, this embryo, or this fetus, is learning all about the universe and its mother, it's mm. listening to its mother's heartbeat. Yeah, so that's our, I would say, a cosmic beginning is the mm. development of the human, the fetal ear at around 20 weeks, they say. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I love that. So they're picking up on all the vibrations through the water and then, you know, bringing it through yeah. the auditory experience. Yeah. yeah. And then somehow all that memory is stored and it's all happening in water. Mm. There's something about our memory with water because in the Jewish cosmology the word memory the word mem means water mm -hmm. mem and the ori is the light so there's something about memory is this liquid light or what you would call plasma yes so we're plasma beings or whatever plasma is I think it's sunshine stars all the stars candle flames it's 99% of the universe really yeah, so plasma. that's all back to the so now we're connecting we're in the womb but we have a direct connection to the cosmos, yeah. even though we're in the being bathed in these mother's waters. Yes. yes. And I love uh, that, that whole conception image too. Um, it just makes me uh, connect with uh, a bit more information on how everything is vibrating. But not only is everything vibrating, everything is spinning. Mm -hmm. And it's the movement that generates the waves of vibration. So the start of everything is movement and everything is moving. Mm -hmm. You know, we have electrons and protons spinning around the nucleus in a cell, creating mm -hmm. sound. So we spin have... is life in a sense. Mm -hmm. And you were saying something about how that relates to the original egg being penetrated, what were you saying before? Yeah, so, um, you know, yeah, we have the Earth spinning on the axis, we have the planet spinning on the macrocosmic level around the sun, and at the very moment of conception, the sperm spin the egg so rapidly that it spins the soul into matter. Oh, I did not know that. That's holding the soul sound signature within no. that. But that's what it, the sperm needs to do to actually no. um, and, penetrate and, the egg. And that's one sperm amongst probably millions of other sperms all fighting Yes. To create life. So it's the survival of the fittest, the most mm. fittest or healthiest warrior sperm yes. <laughs> gets, gets to um, fertilise the ovum. It's so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So this is important because this is our, I call it cosmogenesis, mm -hmm. our beginnings. And cosmos means order. So in this chaotic life, we're always learning how to find meaning or order or symmetry. Some people like me seek mathematical symmetry to try and understand the vastness of it all mm -hmm. but but it's not really about numbers and mathematics and geometry it's really 
about consciousness and um, frequency. Mm. Like we need to raise our frequency if we want to change the world or have an influence in life. We've got to raise our vibration so we're never victims. So to me, it's all about um, understanding who we are, our connection to the universe, but raising our frequency yeah. to create the magic in our life, what we want, what we're here to do. Mm. Absolutely. Yes, and the, you know, I work with uh, applying sound directly into our grid, our meridian yes. network, and um, working with specific frequencies, um, looking at the body, where, what is the energy doing? You know, is it um, you know, hot over there? Is it empty here? Are these organs not functioning? And really, uh, you know, specifically applying frequency to the grid to really get everything working at its optimum function. And what I love is that, you know, the ancients, you know, the ancient Taoists used to spend hours and decades out under the stars meditating, drawing in the frequency of the planets and moving it through their grid system, their microcosmic orbit to elevate mm -hmm. consciousness and connecting in with the archetypal energies of the planets. Um, and they say, you know, we need to develop the higher octave function or energies of each of the archetypes, um, the planetary energies and frequencies. They represent different aspects of our psyche. Mm. But now we have tools, you know, with sound that we, with gongs and tuning forks, that we can actually bring these frequencies into our system in a much more uh, faster fashion than spending decades doing it. We can mm. really speed up that process of evolution and our conscious development. So they say, like, when we're talking about the planets, when we're born, our astrology is like a photograph of, uh, of where all the planets were at the time of birth. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, in your work with um, tuning forks, if we have someone's astrology map of mm -hmm. their chart, or their thumbprint or signature, there could be certain, um, there could be enough information in that astrology chart to determine what's their overall tone or mm -hmm. what frequency they would best respond to as an overall? Yeah, there has actually been someone that's developed, looked at their, someone's astrology and developed oh. a musical piece oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> expressing like, that essence of yeah. um, the planetary sounds and in a, in a basically a, um, yeah, symphony really for that individual person. But, you know, I don't think we're subject to also the limitations of the blueprint and that mm. we can actually move beyond that yeah. using sound and vibration to shift some of the things that may be really challenging aspects within our blueprint mm. and really speed up that process of you know getting to that higher expression mm. potential and Rumi has some quote where the way out is through the wound so we're all born with certain lessons or karma or something that we have to work through or blockage mm. but by going through that blockage, we we learn our soul memory, but maybe that's where sound sound comes in to heal and release mm. the blockages in our field. Yeah. So that's why it's so special. That yeah. reminds me of the Chiron mythology and the Chiron mm -hmm. gong here, because yeah. if, you, if you look at the symbol, it's got the key, and Chiron represents. Um, oh. Chiron is the wounded healer. Yeah. yeah. And where Chiron's place in our chart is really um, uncovering some of the deepest, you know, trauma or wounding that we need to, yeah, go through. Chiron is the bridge really between the, what they call the personal planets and the transpersonal. And mm. to actually get to that higher octave mm. planets, we need to go through Chiron, the key. It's so a bridge, a world bridge. And really so look at our deepest traumas and wounding and do the work on shifting that mm. to be able to access. So Chiron could be like a hole in our aura and once we know where the hole is or a little leak, we can heal that and mm. seal that and then progress on. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So your work with sounds taking you deep into planetary energies, music of the spheres, Astrology. Mm. Well, it's really interesting because I 
firstly, my first modality was astrology and astrological therapeutic counselling. Um, and that's where I learned about, you know, our blueprint and, you know, the different aspects of our psyche and how each voice may interact with different voices within our psyche and some of them get along and some of them don't. <laughs> that can, you know, bring up certain personality um, dysfunction or function. Um, and from there, I was, you know, led into energy healing and um, body work, physiological therapies, and then I went into Chinese medicine. Mm, what a synthesis, what a diverse synthesis of amalgamate and all these yeah. different arenas of knowledge. Which, you know, really tapped into, you know, going from sort of more, you know, anatomy, physiology, training and learning to really looking into the ancient medicine of uh, Chinese medicine, which views the body more like a garden of energy that interacts with each other. Mm. And um, unlike the machine that when we have illness or disease, we, you know, we cut something out or mask it with, you know, a medication, not looking mm. at the whole function of the, the human garden and how mm. everything interacts and all the meridians flow and our grid system operates in harmony um, so that was yeah my initial foundation and then I mm. discovered the uh, acutonics sound medicine which basically combines all those humanistic sciences into the one mm -hmm. with the understanding that you know at the very foundation of all life is sound mm. and frequency and now you, you can say that sound is medicine from all that amazing research you've done sound mm. is vibration it's medicine it's a healing has all the healing codes mm. it can activate dormant parts of our body mm. Mm. I think it's also the key to a lot of you know the technology that we're going to be seeing in our future in the age of Aquarius coming mm. up um, Aquarius is the space age yeah anti-gravity technology and being able to go from mm. this planet to that planet within seconds is all mm. about frequency and you talk mm. you listen to the um, scientists who are working on space travel and it's mm. they speak in terms of frequential harmonics and um, that everything they're using is sound for these mm. key technologies and a lot of people are saying that there's all this suppressed knowledge on um, anti-gravity and med beds and all this stuff which is true mm. but I believe the answer is not to fight what's been taken away from us it's about raising our frequency because they, I'm, t I'm getting to this hundred, the hundred monkey effect where mm -hmm. when enough people raise their frequency and vibration, like they like those monkeys on the island, that when one monkey started washing its potatoes in the water, um, they found that when enough monkeys were washing their potatoes in the seashore, they found that other monkeys on other islands did the same thing. Mm -hmm. and we don't know what to call it, like synchronization or morphogenic was something in the morphogenic field when enough people do one good thing it just mm. transmits somehow we're talking yeah. about we, we can't see but there's a vibration that goes global yeah so um i think carl Jung called it um synchronicity or something love it that how did those monkeys on another island know mm. how to wash the potato because it only it took one to have an epiphany mm -hmm. then it took a collective to all do the same thing, become a, mm. a, a community. Yeah. And that little community, that 1%, we'll call it, I think they also call it the 1% effect, when it only takes 1% to change the consciousness of millions of people. Mm. So we each become like a tuning fork. Mm. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I went off there. <laughs> but what's those classic things you do with tuning forks where you tap one and the other one starts ringing? That's when you're teaching resonance. Yeah. Is yeah. that the experiment, like, or the wine glass? or that you, Is that the one with the wine glass where you run your finger around and it rings? But if you listen carefully, the other one is ringing, is that right? Yeah. Is, is that if they're the same glass or...? Yes. Or um, well, they have to have some sort of like vibration right. and or the grandfather another good analogy is the grandfather clocks you know you can have oh, yes, them yes. all ticking at different yes. you know times and then eventually if you've got a room full of them they'll all come into oh, synchronization beautiful yeah that's beautiful yeah that's a key word synchronization yes so chron chron chronos 
is time, so when you say synchron synchronize, that's the chronos, which mm. is Saturn. Mm -hmm. Saturn's the, the father the Lord of, of Lord time. Of time. The rings yeah. pass not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when I think of time, I, th I think of time codes, I think of the Sumerians, I think of the 60 seconds in a minute, and the 60 minutes make an hour. But when we calculate the number of seconds in a day, because that's what Cousteau, Hans Cousteau did to get all the frequencies of the planets, when we look at how many seconds are there in a day, it'll be 24 hours mm. times 60 minutes times 60 seconds, and you get this big number, mm. 86,400. 86,400. But when we um, look at how many seconds in just a day or a night, so we halve that full 24 hours, so in a day or night, Half of that is 43,200. So in harmonic maths, what I work with, if we have a big number like 43,200 seconds in a day or night, we drop the zeros and we've got 432. Mm. And 432 is pretty much a signature for time. That's the time, I call it a time code. Yeah. But this whole thing on harmonic mathematics is not taught in schools. It's kind of a lost knowledge that it holds all the secrets. It shows where all the symmetries are. Yeah. And yeah. 432 just happens to fall into synchronisation and harmony with the music of the spheres. That's right, it's a key number. Yeah. yeah. It's also in the well, pyramid. Well, we use yeah. music as a, as a way of communication yeah. and tune in a concert pitch to that compared to the 440. Mm. It is actually just more in sync or harmonises yeah. uh, more beautifully with that. It doesn't create dis discord mm. or... Um, well, that's what I mean. If everyone's upset about why we're using the concert pitch at 440 hertz, which is harmonically disharmonic, if enough people just start tuning their instruments to 432 and raising their vibration, then change will happen. We don't have to fight the enemy. Yeah. It's rather just become activated through the knowledge that we have. And, mm. and 432 is also in the, the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Um, I'm going back to mathematics again, but when you look at the pyramid in Egypt, it was, it never, there was no hieroglyphs in there. It was not a burial chamber. It was, it was mm -hmm. a kind of like an astrolabe. It was a initiation chamber, but people think it was a, a for Cheops was a pharaoh that they dedicated to, it's not. But um, when we look at the angle of the pyramid, that um, the slope height of the pyramid has a critical angle. It's called 51 degrees or mm -hmm. 51 degrees, 50, one minutes, and that's half the water angle. So the, the, the water angle, when you look at H2O, hydrogen, oxygen, water, it's 104 degrees, and half of that is the pyramid angle. So the pyramid angle has this a connection to the water bond angle, but if we wanted to convert that angle of 51 degrees, say it's close to 52 minutes, 52 mm -hmm. degrees, if you multiply that by 60 minutes and then 60 seconds, you end up getting 186,624 seconds in that angle, which is the speed of light. So the pyramid in Egypt had, wow. had a direct harmonic relationship to the speed of light. And the reason why that number is important is 186,624 miles per second for the speed of light is 432 squared. So if you take the number 432 and square mm. it, yep. you get the speed of light. So everything I know when I research the science of sound, mm. it always comes back to 432, 432. Mm. So, and, and that's what got me very interested in the work that you're doing, that you've been doing this for so long now. And mm. um, you've tapped, and I, I wasn't aware of this vast sonic knowledge in your library. What you, you know, I'm only just making the connections now. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so your work is really important and valuable that um, more people know about the power of sound and the healing. Mm. This is the future. The work that you're doing is very, so necessary. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we need it more than ever, don't we, as a um, population. So much disconnection, you know, people are experiencing. People, people are waking up. There's a lot of calamities and mm. world wars going on, but I think there is hope. You know, and it's all back to education. Yeah. Remembering the ancient science and how they all intersect each other and mm. they're all connected. It's holistic. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, my vision is that, you know, every family, at least one person in every family, be trained in some of these arts, the art of 
sound application to be able to work on different co common and complex health conditions that arise, you know, as a standard first aid tool, really, you know, mm. that we don't, we can rely on something natural and easy, easily accessible like sound. Yeah. Um, we can, which brings empowerment, you know, to have empowerment over our own health and well-being and our frequency and our energy on a daily basis. So in a way we become our own doctor in a way. Yeah. Uh, we, we love and appreciate the work of you know, modern medicine, but ultimately we have to heal our own selves and um, mm. ask a lot of questions, do a lot of research, put the right minerals in our body. Yeah. Yes. Mm. We need the physical to be functioning at high, mm. high capacity for you know, our spirit to be healthy mm. as well. So all these tuning forks, you know, they're like different minerals that we need in a way. You could say that every... They do have correspondence, you know, like Mars yeah. correlates to iron. Of course, yes, yes. And Mars rules the blood and the, uh, the fight or uh, defence system. Um, and when we use Mars, we can use it to build blood and work on blood deficiency issues mm -hmm. and building iron. Right. Frequency of the sun relates to vitamin D, of course. Mm. So you're saying without taking iron supplements, we can actually get that memory of iron just through the frequency. The frequency of, of the iron. That is, see, that's so far around. That's very yeah. Impressive. <laughs> yeah. And I, so no. there could be a whole library for every mineral. There's a special tuning fork or frequency yeah. for everything. Like every organ in the body has a different... It's like the law of correspondence. Everything in the universe co has correspondence. Exactly. Yeah. Like with our herbal herbs, you know, correspond to planets, correspond to this or that or parts yeah. of our body and energy. Yeah, so, you know, imagine being able to send the sun uh, tuning fork to everybody yeah. that lives up at the North Pole who only get, you know, an hour of sunlight a day at certain yeah. times of the year and they get, you know, the... The SADS, you know, um, mm. from not having enough vitamin D and depression. Mm. And if they could just use a bit of sun on themselves every day. And I recognize that when I use the sun, it's this level of light and energy and joy and spark that you get from the sun. And mm -hmm. you can feel that running, vibrating mm. through the body. And talking about the sun, that reminds me of um, photosynthesis because plants turn the sunlight into energy. And under a microscope, when you look at what makes chlorophyll mm -hmm. it's a mandala and it, in the center of the mandala is magnesium that's why everyone loves magnesium for healing mm -hmm. but that identical mandala of chlorophyll is identical to when you talked about iron the center of the human blood hemen is identical to chlorophyll or wheatgrass mm -hmm. juice they're identical but it's iron in the middle whereas chlorophyll has ma a magnesium and I just heard, I don't know where I heard this, on guy or somewhere, but I was just listening to something and there was a third one which I didn't know about in the sea kingdom, in mm -hmm. the kingdom of the ocean, there's all these like octopuses and creatures called cephalopods, mm -hmm. anyway, or mollusks. In the, in the centre of their blood is not magnesium or iron, but copper. So there's another whole species of creatures in the ocean wow. called cephalopods. It's either in the ocean or the snails family, but they will have copper in their blood. Mm. So I can imagine that each, what you're saying, eat copper, iron, magnesium, they all have a certain thumbprint or signature or yeah. frequency that gives them the, their uniqueness of life. It's interesting. Uh, Venus rules copper. Of course, yes. And Mars rules iron. And women have 20%, 20 well, men have 20% more iron in their blood than women. Okay, I didn't know that. And just thinking of what you're saying about the sea creatures having more copper, that feels like they're in the water, they're more feminine. Mm, yeah. <laughs> They've got the oceanic watery element, which is a feminine vibration, mm. which kind of corresponds to the Venus and the copper. Just yeah. a good Yeah. <laughs> but what was interesting correlation. is that they under a microscope they all have the same mandala, but the only thing different is the centre molecules. Mm. And that kind of made me think about blood what is blood it contains dna this is the origin of all life and they have unique variations but essentially there's a template for all of creation and somehow these tuning forks that you work with can relate to all these realms and worlds and species yeah in the macro the micro mm. yeah i do love that when we connect into the you know every planet mm. in our 
solar system, it does relate to all aspects of the human experience. And you know, each planet mm. has correlation to different physical attributes, emotional, mental, spiritual mm. aspects. So that's where we can really fine tune what someone needs. And mm -hmm. looking about the law of opposites, you know, if someone's energy is down, we can bring in uplifting frequencies, or if someone's cold, we can bring in the sun, mm -hmm. or, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> so when I think of the solar system, I'm thinking what you talked about before, the spin, everything is movement, everything's all about movement, mm -hmm. movement is life, spin is life, um, so death would be when everything stops, is it when there's movement? Yeah. Death Maybe is a form of stop. going back to the wuxi. You know how you were saying to me earlier mm -hmm. that within the spin in the centre mm -hmm. is the whole. Were you saying that? The, yeah. The, the vacuum, how are you describing the, the vacuum? The yes. vacuum, like the Taoists refer to that as the wuxi, the yeah. the void, the nothingness. Right. So it's like we can maybe spin back to the mm -hmm. Wuchi or the portal of the womb, you know, mm -hmm. where we incubate <laughs> until the next movement. Because yeah, death could be seen therefore as a rebirth when we go through a black hole or we're reborn into another yeah. reality. Mm -hmm. Nothing really stops, everything just keeps continuing. Yeah, yeah. it does. It all started with Om. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? It all started with Om. And I love the way that every Bible in the world has a creation of the beginning in the beginning yes you know some people say it was the word some say it's the logos but it's all about something to do with vibration or the original yeah. spark even if you want to think of like, the big bang it's still yeah. like that first movement yeah. the explosion of sound that then permeated yeah. out to create bits of life yeah. everywhere so we were in the womb that story about when we were the one two four we were also a biological big bang but mm. what i don't understand about um, physics when we talk about the big bang that where the universe is still expanding i see some limitation in the big bang because yeah. nothing can keep exploding forever at some point there has to be a loop back to source and it's got to be not just explosion but implosion which is the return to the center return mm. to the heart so that reminds me of the torus yes so the big bang is correct the universe is forever expanding but nothing can just keep expanding forever there's got to be Wholeness. So you think that it starts to contract yes, that, back in? That's yeah, that's why I love it. We start we'll start to yes. maybe get closer because you know, with that's the right. expansion uh, they're saying everything is moving out from the sun. Yes. Slowly and slowly moving and that away is correct, from the but sun. It's not the fulfillment of mm. our reality. It can't keep expanding. So one day we mm -hmm. might start journeying back towards the sun. It could yeah, that that's my image of the Taurus. That, yeah. Which um I, I my my study with sacred geometry i believe that the golden ratio is the key to the torus but the, the torus is a model of the universe in fact scientists are now calling the universe the impliverse they're they're recognizing that the universe does have structure and the mm. vacuum is not empty space there's structure within structure so that the the grand unified field to me is the torus mm -hmm. within the torus within a torus or toroids within toroids yeah and that allows spin movement access to the bigger worlds and also to the microcosm mm. so i believe that that ratio 1.618 which is what our body is all about if this is one to the elbow from here to there is 1.618 so that golden ratio is in all animals in all stars systems mm. all planets everything i know so so by studying science as we know it and researching we find that that things have to come back to the source. Yes. Yeah, so, so all we can do is... The circle. Yes. Or the journey the, in yes, life. The, or the infinity, like the infinity symbol. Yes. Because yes. if you take the Taurus, I'll just grab the Taurus for a second. Um, if I was to... Um, so the Taurus has suction to the centre, but on the other side it's exploding. So that's exploding, but somehow the explosion has to loop back to implosion which mm. is the key to all free energy systems, suction yes. to the heart, and that's where we came from, the black hole. Um, but if I was to cut the torus in half, if you could see I was holding the slinky, if I cut the torus in half, you'd have a circle here and a circle there. So what you're really seeing is the infinity symbol. So the cross-section of the torus is infinity. 
So, but I, I see the torus within the torus as the fundamental geometry of everything, mm. which is really the sphere. It is a fourth dimensional sphere, but it's sucking into the center. Yep. It's all about a return to the center. Yes, beautiful. Yeah. And we were a Taurus in the womb. We, yes. we I think we still are Taurus, you know, we have that connection to the earth and oh, the, the yes. heavens constantly yeah, circulating through our systems. That's so true, it's yeah. beautiful. We have a Taurus field. Mm. And it's a lot of, um, when I was studying Pranayama, I did some, not many, I'd done a few days of courses, and the teacher that was teaching Prana, they could do psychic surgery. They, these are people from overseas, who, from Philippines, they could actually put your, their hand into your body and pull out a tumour. Yeah. And they were teaching us how to work with, um, just put that down. Um, when I was studying pranayam, they were teaching that there was an egg shaped field around you, and we had to learn how to feel a person's field, mm. which I call the Taurus field. And you could feel if it's warm or cold, but there was a way of getting permission to come into someone's field, and you could mm. see their body like you've got x-ray eyes so yeah so what i love about all this research is that it's all coming back to healing mm. or to wholeness um, yes yeah thank you jane no thank you this <laughs> has been fascinating I, I always learn so much more when i talk with you and meet up with you and... yeah likewise yeah. it's always a pleasure yes yes we'll do it again yeah yay